Okay, so um, welcome everybody to this event that we've called Guts and Grace, Embody, Empower, Energize and Inspire Current and Potential Quality and Improvement Professionals. My name is Suzanne Hill and I am the chair of the Derby and Nottingham CQI branch and we're working this week in conjunction with the CQI Quality Careers Week. So a few uh, little bits of housekeeping before we get going with the main event. Uh, this, this event will be recorded. It is being recorded. Uh, so please could you turn off your cameras uh, and apply mute. Um, we've found a way of just viewing the video um, the people with videos on. If you go to the top of your screen and see the view um, icon, if you click on that and then go down until you see the prioritize video and toggle that so that there's a tick by it, then you should just see the people with their video on, which are the, um, the presenters for this evening. As we go through the, um, the event, uh, we will um, we invite you to use the chat to ask any questions and they will be covered in a Q&A session at the end. So I invite you to sit back and get involved with your questions and the CQI will circulate the information from this event um, to all attendees. So without further ado, I'm just going to ask uh, each one of, of us to do a very brief introduction, uh, which will lead us nicely onto the event itself. Firstly, Amanda. Hello and good evening. I'm Amanda Mackay. I'm currently an uh, honorary professor with the University of Western Scotland. Thank you, Amanda. Amber? Hi, uh, I'm Amber Jowers and I am currently a quality coordinator for HB Fuller. Thank you, Ange. Hi everyone, I'm Angela. Um, I am currently founder of uh, my own business, White Tiger Quality Management and Business Improvement. Thank you. Uh, will introduce herself when she arrives. Unfortunately, we've just had a pre-meet and she was she was with us. So uh, maybe there's a little bit of a, something gone awry with her connection. So uh, Sarah. Hi, good evening. I'm Sarah Gould. I'm head of lean improvement and aftermarket within Rolls-Royce. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm Suzanne Hill and um, like Ange, I run my own business. Uh, a Improved quality assurance. Victoria? Hi, uh, I'm Victoria Derbyshire. I am a senior quality practitioner, soon to be quality manager for Cavendish Nuclear, and I'm also a uh, trustee for the CQI. Lovely, thank you. And last but by no means least, Victoria. Um, I'm Victoria Tate, and I am a quality specialist in healthcare working for myself. Excellent. And thank I am you. also, shall I carry on, the host of this evening? Yes, um, thank you. So, yes, good evening and welcome to the seventh and um, what is the final webinar of Quality Careers Week 2024. Tonight we've got a panel of seven renowned quality and business improvement professionals who are eagerly waiting to answer the who, what, why, where and when of their careers in quality. So this event will hopefully stimulate everyone listening and have enable similar discussions and reflections of their own occupations this evening and beyond. So on Monday, Alexander Woods, the CQI policy manager, hosted a session on what does a typical quality career look like? I'll come to you, Victoria Derbyshire, first. So you've won CQI Emerging Talents Award in 2019, and five years on, you're now a chartered CQI member and a member of the CQI Board of Trustees, as well as a senior quality professional at Cavendish Nuclear. Was this something that you sort of thought about doing from a school age, or um, would you say you've had a typical quality career? No. <laughs> so uh, when I think back, it was 
it was all just after a rubbish day at college school wasn't really for me I wanted to get out and I came home one day and I just started browsing the apprenticeships website to see what what I could find and then I came across a quality apprenticeship in the nuclear industry and you know I'd never heard of quality before they don't teach it in school but the description was really exciting the sector was interesting so I quickly put my application in two minutes before it closed um which stressed my mum out quite a lot. And then when I got the interview, thankfully the interview process included an introduction to quality, which was so helpful because, like I say, it's not taught in schools. You don't come out of school thinking, I want to be a quality manager. Um, And, you know, when I actually really got to understand it in the interview, I thought, well, this is a role that allows me to be involved in all functions of a business with the ultimate goal of helping to improve, um, which, you know, I really enjoyed because I don't feel like I'm confined to one area. And it's also a role where I feel like I can really, really make a difference. Yeah, and I think that's such a huge selling point um, for the role in quality. It's a job where you can be involved in and with many different functions of an organisation and every day has got variation. Um, And from personal experience, I know it can mean visiting different countries as well. Gillian, um, not sure she's joined us yet. Um, She hasn't. She hasn't. So Dan's going to fill in for her with her responses. So she also did an apprenticeship in design and engineering, and she's got 30 years in quality, aerospace and defence. So how and why did you progress from quality into your apprenticeship? Okay, so Gillian said, after serving my apprenticeship in design engineering, I was offered the opportunity to do a rotation in quality, where I could see that there was more scope to identify risks and opportunities through our governance and compliance structure and identify areas for improvement, which was an area I really, that really cap, captured my interest as a career option and has done for the last 30 years and continues to do so. Yeah, and like, like you said, rolling quality has longevity if you want it to. Um, I'm now 20 plus years into my career, but from my own personal experiences, my entry into quality was more by default Um, It was an option presented to me following a diagnosis of occupational asthma in pharmaceutics. Um, So it allowed me to remain in the same company for that organisation and to recruit investment that they'd already put me into for their recruitment, interview, training, um, etc. Amber, your path into quality certainly was unconventional, wasn't it? But probably such a familiar story to many other quality professionals on the call today that the same experience of just falling into a quality role. Yeah, I mean, like Victoria, I didn't really leave school with any kind of sort of clear idea of what path I wanted to go down. So I initially did what a lot of people do is went into customer service um, and I was in a customer facing role. um, And due to the resource levels in the quality department at the time, um, which is probably familiar to a lot of quality professionals, um, they asked if uh, anyone wanted to volunteer to help assist the department temporarily for a few days. Um, as soon as I started helping out I realised actually I'm more interested in this than I was ever in the customer service side of things this was in uh, residential quality so uh, looking at uh, gas safe certificates and right right to rent for tenants Um, and I think finding out more about the different requirements of the industry you got a better more in-depth look at the inner workings of a business um than I ever did in customer service and I kind of could see things from start to finish um so because of this I ended up uh, staying in that department and moved permanently and then we're eight years later and I'm still in quality and I am in a different industry now but yeah so I it was through customer service that I actually uh for an email really And coming to you, Angela, in contrast, your path into quality was a bit more conventional, wasn't it? And from your very first role in employment. So do you want to expand on this? Yeah, um, basically, I did train as mechanical engineering and manufacturing, 
but I was just passionate about how things ticked. I wanted to make them better. So my first role was with Tolerance Rings and they made the role for me as a continuous improvements engineer. Um, they were having difficulty with the bearings. Nothing was working. Every time they reconditioned it, it, it wasn't the same. So I created a standards room, got involved in statistical process control um, and ended up you know, looking at the automotive standards and doing the IQA as it was the exams and looking into quality. So right from the beginning, uh, it was always continuous improvement and quality. And Amanda, Sarah and Suzanne, you've all had similar experiences in quality, um, almost as a sort of result of your job role being scoped and moulded around your areas of interest and your responsibilities and projects that you were after, asked to do for the organisation. <clears throat> and a new job position was created for you, which was a first for those organisations. So how have you since consciously crafted your role to suit your strengths and allowed you to reach your best potential? Suzanne, I'll come to you first. Like, You have a worldwide recognition in aerospace for excellence in problem solving, quality management, implementation of change, zero defect thinking training and consultancy and you're an active volunteer a fellow member of the cqi as well as a stem ambassador was this conscious job crafting by yourself um i don't think so i sort of never consciously crafted any of my roles specifically for me um but looking back uh, i probably did it subconsciously uh, back in 1999 i took on a, a role in um, as a quality manager um, which included both product quality planning, which is my specialism, um, as well as the accountability for negotiation of contracts. So um, part of that role was totally alien to me. I'd never done negotiation of contracts and I was fully, I was totally outside my, my comfort zone. Um, so for me, it was getting the right team around me um, to undertake these aspects that was essential. And um, they actually crafted some, those, those people that I got in actually crafted some fabulous uh, deals, some really innovative deals at, at the time that I never would have thought of. Uh, so I learned so much for them and it broadened my horizons. And I basically took that um, to me with, in, into my future roles. So for me, getting the right skilled professionals around you um into the right roles is really essential for for crafting um your jobs and to be able to learn from each other to achieve the best potential for everyone uh, is is really important and i guess ultimately you've been able to deliver the best possible version of those businesses to meet and exceed their customer ex expectations as well yeah. So, Sarah, as a Lean Six Sigma black belt, does this resonate with you? Yes, absolutely. I can see a connection between delivering the business benefits and the drive for zero defects. But you've got to do that through effective business improvement projects. So I'm probably the imposter on the course. I'm not part of the quality function. I'm a business improvement function, but we, we align with the quality function. Um, but it's really important to, to do that. And I use my ability to see the wider scope and the business priorities to drive the right improvements at the right time. So where does the benefit land and how are people going to do that? And then getting other people to spot the synergies to help them align them to the business priorities and, what, and working on something that they like. So it's making sure that you're getting, you ultimately do what gets measured. So make sure that you do what's going to get measured. And the function of others um, that we encounter can be a big component of job crafting and diversifying ourselves. Angela, I'll come to you again. Your roles have dramatically changed over the years. What you've, have you put this down to? Um, well, uh, when you say about influence, my first influence was actually uh, someone in the in the branch at the CQI. He became my mentor. He was also my tutor for my exams. Uh, and he co-opted me into the committee before I was old enough to be a member back in those days. Uh, so I think it was just 
Well, for me, I've moved my perspective because I've changed roles into a mentor because I personally, you know, love helping others. So I think fortunately I've been able to study NLP and coaching and that's allowed me to then change the way I look at things and how I communicate to others in the company. And I think that's one of our big roles is to how we communicate and how we educate other people on quality within our organisations. Yeah, and I, I know as a consultant myself that I'm cons- constantly, consciously and subconsciously pivoting my business to make it work for me, um, working in my business as well as all my business and only trying to present positive energy to my clients and even more so working with clients that have invested in and value quality improvements, which does sometimes make you think about who you want to work with and who you don't want to work with. Amanda, is there anything you wouldn't do again in your career? I, th- I think one of the key things for me is um, choosing the right organisation to work for. Um, over the years, I've worked for a number of organisations who didn't value quality. And there's nothing worse than trying to sell a concept or to um, drive a culture which leadership doesn't want or doesn't recognise. Um, I've seen that in oil and gas. I've seen that in construction. Uh, and I've seen it in parts of the nuclear industry as well. And it's so demoralising to try and deliver something and know that you could make a difference to what they're doing, but the organisation doesn't really buy into it. Um, I'm, I've recently been contracting, which is a new thing for me, and working in oil and gas decommissioning. And they, uh, despite the fact you're working for literally the scrap man, they have a real concept of quality and want to drive things in the right direction because for them making money out of scrap is very difficult and i've seen i've been really enlightened in the last couple of months working for an organization that values quality and i think that's really important it gives you a real boost in your career and helps with innovation across the organization yeah, I can t- totally agree with that, Amanda. We could spend a lot of time and sadly energy with individuals mm-hmm. and organisations that just don't get or want to make a connection between quality improvements and a high return on investment. Sarah, what would your now your your unique selling point for quality and improvement be as a business improvement specialist? So I've kind of learnt now that the 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 USP for us is the is is the tools and techniques. They're your unique selling point. Not everybody gets them. Although to a lot of us, they feel like common sense. Your job or our job is to choose the most effective tool for the problem and coach people through an issue or work through the process. Don't just say here's a fishbone diagram or here's a problem statement and off you go. Follow it through with them help them develop a problem statement ask them how they could have been how the problem could have been created where does the data suggest we go and investigate what we should we try as a fix and how well we know when it's been successful i've just described there the demaic process but nobody needs to know it's called demaic so it's just about coaching rather than just giving somebody the tool uh, and is that something that comes from experience or confidence or from others recognising something in you or making use of platforms such as um, the Quality Careers Hub that has tools, assessments and advice to support us all. Suzanne, is there anything you'd like to have changed in your career path? What are your thoughts on this? Um, I would not have turned down an offer of a senior role at the age of 28. Um, I didn't think I was ready for it uh, and I should have actually be, had more confidence in myself. Uh, and accepted it. It was a really great opportunity. Um, an executive within a customer facing business had taken me under her wing and was supporting my career planning and offered me and, ha- and offered me basically a business improvement um, uh, role within the executive team. But at the time I just got cold feet and said, mm, no, I'm not ready, uh, which was a real shame. And I, looking back on it, um, I, I do think about how my career might have been different um but that being said it, literally it was just a hiccup because i actually took on a similar role about 10 years later uh and really i wish i suppose i'd done it earlier um and now that role has given me the courage to do what i'm doing now which is uh, running my own successful business 
Yeah, and what you've said is is such a big part of us as quality professionals, empowering and encouraging others um, as peers, colleagues, mentors, and even mentees to make the right decision for themselves at the right time in their lives. And I know we discussed in our planning sessions for this evening, not overthinking decisions due to self-doubt, and most importantly, not braiding ourselves over perceived failures. Um, Vic, do you want to kind of expand on this? Yeah, um, it would be lovely if none of us made any mistakes, um, but it's just not true. <laughs> so for me, the real shift has been that I, I no longer beat myself up over failure and I wish I hadn't done it because it is by far the most valuable learning experience I could ever have. It taught me things that I couldn't pick up in a classroom, reading a book, someone to tell me. Uh, and it really helped me understand who I am and, and also how I work and what my strengths and weaknesses are and how I can work around them. Um, and similar to what Amanda was saying, you know, working with organisations that truly kind of value quality. I used to believe it was sort of my personal responsibility to change the world and everybody's perception of quality, but it's just not the case because some people aren't buying and that's fine. Um, but, you know, it's just about always being an advocate for the profession, but having an appreciation of what my circle of influence actually is and where the limits are. Yeah, thanks, Vic. I know looking back on my career, I absolutely wouldn't change the journey that I've had. I was had a forced career change, redundancy, introduced children into the work pattern equation and logistics. And I've used mentors throughout my CQI for guidance. Um, but any of the roles I have had or my experiences have led to where I am now, and I'm content with that. And um, the healthcare organisations I do work with, I'm totally very humbled and privileged to work with. But at various times in our career, we can be so caught up in learning the role, training, maintaining work relationships, comparing ourselves to others. We don't often have that time to look outside of the box. Are there things we'd all wish we'd learned early in our careers? And Amanda, I'll come to you first. You've got over 35 years experience in quality assurance, health and safety management across a wide range of sectors, most recently within nuclear and construction. You're a former chair of the CQI, a former trustee, an honorary professor of the University of the West of Scotland, and a charity trustee with a number of LGBT community charities. Your knowledge is broad and diverse, but there are things, but are there things you'd wish you had learned earlier in your career? Um, I think one of the key things for me um, was digital. That was something that's really changed my career over the last few years. Um, I was an early adopter of digital. I was one of the first people with a BBC computer. For those of you who are old enough to know what that is, that's a very old personal computer. Um, and I never really used um, digital in quality until about the 2000s. Um, it's been a real game changer in the last few years for me, and particularly with jobs at Hinkley C and um, introduction of digital into nuclear at um, AWE. I think it's something that can be a real game changer for the way that we operate. You know, quality 4.0 is something I definitely buy into. Um, but it's really only in recent years that I've sort of worked out that it was not just engineering, not just playing games, but it could actually have a, a really um, valid and important role in what we do with quality. Yeah, and I think actually attending Quality Live, as a lot of people on this call did this year, made me embrace Quality 4.0 and AI sooner um, and increase my awareness and tools so I could join these conversations and present the outputs and benefits of AI to clients sooner. Um, Amber and Victoria, you're both, if I can say it, still relatively new to the quality profession, but already both highly respected senior quality practitioners. Amber, what are your insights into your learning so far? Um, I think I had to learn quite quickly that there's no shame in not knowing the answer to a question straight away. So sitting in meetings with other department managers, um, they can ask you a question that I'll completely blindside you it could be about a different standard a different specification a, a business requirement uh, and it could be mm -hmm. from any type of department so there's no shame in not knowing the answer there and then and just saying leave that with me 
let me give me time to research that and I'll come back to you with a detailed and appropriate answer rather than trying to guess there on your feet and think fast like it's actually better and probably more uh welcomed to say leave that with me I'll come back to you uh, and then that gives you time to learn and look into things a bit more as well yeah totally Beck and if we could rewind the clock on your career oh um I would embrace being the village idiot a bit sooner <laughs> um, <laughs> not being afraid to ask the silly questions I got that from my uh when I did my green belt training and it was briefed to me as you're there to ask the village idiot questions and that's absolutely right and you know if I'd have not been afraid to ask those silly questions earlier on it would have really helped me understand how I can improve and support my organizations so when I did my apprenticeship I, I remember panicking because I didn't know what an audit was god forbid they don't teach you that at school um, and it was two months before I actually brought plucked up the courage to ask my boss what an audit was uh, I was absolutely terrified of looking stupid I remember I was shaking before I asked him but actually the response was, you know, he was very, very grateful for me having the courage to ask the question because that then helped make, you know, the profession more accessible for the next round of um, apprentices. So I've really come to learn over the past couple of years that that nobody thinks poorly of you for asking the simple questions. It is just your own critical mind. Yeah, exactly. We, ca we can't just be expected to know everything or be experts in everything. Um, taking a look at your annual CPD, refreshing your knowledge, learning something new um, or completing something totally unrelated. Like Sudan, for example, you're a student teacher at the British Wheel of Yoga undertaking 500 hours for your level four qualification. Um, but it's a great way to innovate yourself, isn't it? And reintroduce motivation, enthusiasm or health and well-being into your role. Um, Gillian, who's not, not here, but Suzanne will answer on her behalf. Can you add anything with your experiences? Absolutely. So she said that, you know, developing a better understanding of her own leadership styles, um, her own leadership style and behaviours and their potential impact on others is really important. Um, the lesson from childhood of treat others as you would want to be treated um, has pr has proven to her to be fundamentally flawed as others in my team do need to be treated in a different way uh, to how maybe I would like to be um, in, in terms of preparation, levels of data and decision making. So, yeah. Yeah, and we quite often underrate these skills and bizarrely, They've been named soft skills when really having these essential personal dynamics and a better emotional intelligence can aid us with our own psychological safety and create behaviours and a culture to thrive and flourish from. We're nearly at the end of our panel session with hopefully time for questions from the audience. So I'll just quickly come to each of you again in turn. What is the main piece of advice you would give to the next generation of quality professional? Come to you, Amanda. I think one of the first things I was given early on in my my career was, you know, uh, never be afraid to try something new. Uh, and every day really is a skill day. Mm -hmm. So for those starting out in the quality career, what I'd say is get involved and learn from experience and the experience of those around you. Um, I volunteered to get involved in many projects and it stood me in good stead to this day. And that way you learn quicker and gain experience faster. And never be afraid to fail as long as you learn from it um that thing is the key for me is that you know we only learn through failure or through making mistakes or through uh, trying trying different things and seeing what works um so failure is not necessarily uh to be afraid of it's something to be uh, learned from and amber um i think that uh, communication and uh, people skills uh, need to be some of the strongest tools in your t quality toolkit, as you might say, um, because as a quality uh, team member, you're going to uh, representative, you're going to be speaking to a lot of people who communicate in different ways and have different uh, needs. And uh, you just need to learn how to adapt and approach people in uh, in the way that they would 
best be approached and uh, communicated with. Great, right, Angela, some final thoughts from you. Yeah, I would I would agree with communication, but I would add understanding how the business works so that you can learn how to fit that in with the business strategy. So if you can learn how your part fits into the big picture and be able to communicate up as well as communicate into your team. So that's um, that's how people can understand. They can understand your map of the world and, and the quality map of the world. And the other thing that's you know stood me in good stead is learning coaching and leadership skills. Even if you haven't got a team to manage, it'll help you understand yourself better. And it's it's just a catalyst for improvement. So, and it's it's just a vital skill, I think, that everybody could do with learning a little bit in terms of the there's leaders at every level. If you can learn some leadership and coaching skills. Yeah. And Suzanne, on Gillian's behalf. Yeah, she says, you know, get involved in as many aspects uh, of the profession as you can uh, continue your own professional development. So keep learning whilst you're doing that and, and networking um, maybe even um, mentoring as well to understand the best practice across all sectors. Um, as our skill set is really transferable across sector to sector to sector and um, valuable lessons can be taken from, from all of the various sectors that each of us work in. Coming to you, Sarah, what can you add about your experiences from Rolls-Royce? Yeah, so I think it's really interesting that Anne then spoke about leadership skills and stuff. So in, in Rolls Royce, we've actually got six lean leadership behaviours. But even if you took the word lean out, they're just leadership behaviours. And I'd really advise people to, to think about following them. So we've got lead by coaching. So understand where the other person is coming from and enable them to have a growth mindset. The second one is ch question and challenge, but ask open questions and what more can we do to help? Not a why aren't you doing that properly? We've all been on the receiving end of those. And then the third one's really important. Act on data, not just gut feel. Data will help you get to the root cause. Gut feel, you will fluke it once or twice, but it will not be a career choice. OK, so really get the data. And then it's that then we go on to like ensuring that we've got full compliance to the standard. So a problem is a deviation away from standard. No standard, no problem. And people don't like it when I say that to them. But what's the standard? Where's the standard? Are we using the standard? Is the standard effective? Yeah. And it's amazing how many issues can arise from just those simple questions. And then the fifth one is about doing what you said you would do. It builds trust, it builds integrity, and it helps form really good relationships because then you're relied upon and you're part of that team and you're integrating yourself well. And then the final one, and, and these can go in any order, is uh, go look, see. Go and have a look at what the, under, the issue is for yourself. See it, feel it, hear it from the person that it's creating. Don't just sit in your ivory tower going, oh, that machine's really noisy, is it, and giving you a non-conformance issue. Go, go and feel it. I'll come to you, Suzanne. Final thoughts. Um, obviously, I've, I'm I'm very much a Rolls Royce person as well at heart. So um, appreciate what Sarah's just said. Then and and for me, um, any quality profession, take on as many opportunities as you can. Don't turn down opportunities, and to challenge yourself and grow your grow your portfolio of um, quality experience and obviously the people side as well the people skills absolutely essential I'm coming to you Vic lastly so my the one the one thing I say to everybody is is that experience is not the number of years you have behind you it is what you've done with those years and I'm not talking about age there age is irrelevant if you are coming into quality towards the end of your career, this applies to you. If, if you are coming into quality mid or early, it still applies to you. Just take all the opportunities for development and new experience as you can. You don't have to work to everyone else's expectations of time. Just go at your own pace um, and, and it will work for you. Yeah, I com completely agree with that. And there's some great points from everybody. So on that note, thank you everyone for keeping to timings and inspiring others with examples of ways we can all develop and deliver at our own pace. 
Hopefully all the answers from everyone in the panel that answered all of the questions will be published in Quality World is what we're fingers crossed hoping. Um, and if you'd like to perhaps contribute to these conversations at next year's Quality Live event, then the CQI would love to hear from you. So then I'll hand you back to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, everybody um, on the panel on behalf of the uh, uh, the attendees here and also the CQI Derby and Nottingham branch. Um, what I'd like to do now is just go towards the um, questions and answers. And other than um, the AI assistant helping, um, ah, that's interesting, Adrian. Adrian, you're saying that 35 years ago, I was voluntold to do a quality role and he's never looked back since. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think we can all relate to that one. Um, Mark says, um, I've been asking the village idiot questions for 25 years and I don't plan on stopping. So that's pulling upon um, Victoria's um, uh, words there. No question is a dumb question. Absolutely. Um, if you don't know the answer, you don't know the answer, and you ask you ask people to um, uh, to help you. Uh, what does um, we've got another one saying? I couldn't remember the name of the project that brings unsuccessful back back then. Entrepreneurs together to give advice to prospective entre entrepreneurs by telling them their worst failures. I reminded that concept and now and now curious. I reminded that concept and now curious about what mistakes do you remember? Ah, okay. So um, it's, uh, they're curious about what mistakes do you remember as successful people right now? So what mistakes could you pull upon that you've learned from? Um, anybody want to answer that one? Victoria. I made the mistake in my first business improvement project in that I assumed everybody, all stakeholders would be bought in from the get go and were really happy to be involved. <laughs> and I got a shock. Um, and that was when Cotter's change model book was sort of slammed on my desk to say, read point number one, create the urgency. You know, there might be a budget, a project sponsor, a project team assigned and you're there ready to go. Does not mean they're happy to be there. Doesn't mean that they want to do it. So you still have to go through that. And whilst it did set the project I was doing back, it has probably been one of, if not the most valuable experience I still call upon today. Brilliant. Yes, um, I think we've all we've all had that, haven't we? Oh, it's easy, but quality is not easy. Sarah, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, there's so many mistakes we'll be here all night. But I think the big one for me now, and I've, I've actually done it this week, is we, we run lots of learning or training sessions and we've got a simulation where we get people engaged in stuff. But I won't take anybody on a course that's been voluntold. I only want people that want to volunteer and want to be there. So I've actually canned a training session next week because I've heard a whisper and I've been unchecked and they've been voluntold. So I've I've canned it because otherwise mm. it's it's not value added for the facilitator for the individuals or for the business because they don't actually they don't really want to be there they're probably not listening to what you're saying and they're not going to take that information back with them they're just going to have a nice two days with me eating sweets so that's not how it works yes it's certainly a, a waste of valuable resource isn't it uh, of your resource predominantly but also um them them back in in, in their their places of work Excellent. So uh, anybody got any others, any other learnings at all? I think I've got can... one, which is more about how we conduct our meetings. As anyway, you know, you remember the management review, everything, it was always a quality meeting and nobody wanted to be there. And so bringing it in with business strategy and taking little bits and making it part of everybody else's meeting was better, uh, you know, learn, I wish I'd learned that earlier. Uh, and and how to talk strategy to them rather than saying come to my quality meeting and everyone sat there and just yeah nobody wanted to be there 
Mm. <laughs> like mixes. So yeah, yes. how can we integrate mm. everything with the business rather than being on our own and aside? Yeah, definitely. I have a, a really fundamental one from my early days in quality and particularly in oil and gas. I was working on a, a project in the North Sea, which was had an American, a large amount of American engineering input. And the North Sea for many years has always um, worked in metric. Everything is metric, except when you use American engineers. And I was happily designing something uh, and doing the um, quality plan for a piece of equipment, only to find the piece of equipment that we designed in uh, centimetres and metres turned up in um, feet and inches and obviously didn't fit and it was a, a subsea template that was meant to fit over an existing uh, well and it wasn't until it arrived offshore that anybody realized um, when we looked at the project specification we never specified the measurement standards and information at the beginning wow about, that's an expensive mistake about 40 million pounds crikey Wow, just because you didn't uh, you didn't so, clarify mm, the um, measurement uh, standards the measurement and what standards. we were working to, yeah. And in so, those days, it was chuck it over the side and start again, literally. Go. Oh. It was 1988. Hmm, it'd been interesting <laughs> to, do, to to have done a root cause on that one. Uh, yes, I think everybody had a. Uh, was rather embarrassed by it and it got um, yeah. shoved to the back but uh, it was the first thing I used to put into quality plans from then on was the measurement standards and where the measurement would be taken from i.e. the you know which standard body we would use right yeah super good so Mark I think that was a very very good um, question uh, no sorry uh, yeah, that was a previous very good question. And um, Mark, there's a final one from you. Um, you're saying that you're currently involved in an initiative with the audit special interest group, and it would help your research if you knew from Victoria, Derbyshire and Amber specifically, um, if you were aware of any clear signposting into quality um, once you left the education system. Who's going first? You can, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, the short answer is no. It was very much fend for yourself. And I remember at the time apprenticeships still were this kind of, oh, the for non-academics, the for people who struggle in classrooms and there are people who aren't. They were for people who weren't capable of doing university and that's absolutely not the case. Um, and it was all, it was, just by chance when that quality apprenticeship came up on the government apprenticeships page there was no real direction from me there was no direction from the college's careers advisor it was only actually when i joined nuvia at the time and the nuclear industry did i see other signposting so for example um sellafield and balfour bt were already running a um, quality apprenticeship scheme which was well signposted in that area of, of the UK in Cumbria, uh, but I wouldn't have seen it. And it's a shame that it's generally only within industries that they're pushing it. There doesn't seem to this, there doesn't seem to be this pull from schools, um, mm. which might have made things slightly different for me. I mean, right. it, was the same. it was the same for me, really. There was, I've never heard of quality until I started at, uh countrywide uh residential and they had a quality department um and that was the first time I ever came across anything to do with quality nothing at college nothing at secondary school um apprenticeships a similar kind of uh, situation I, I thought apprenticeships to me were unfortunately the perception was people who maybe didn't do as well at school and would go to do a, 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 some, a construction apprenticeship that I didn't even know there was apprenticeships in things that weren't manual labour related, which is quite a crazy thing to think about now. But 
back then I just assumed that was what apprenticeships were for so for me it was literally until I had to work somewhere that had a quality department I was like oh what's this uh, thing I'd never heard of before but I, yeah so it's pretty much the same for me. Lovely so thank you both of you for those questions I think um, I've actually part of the CQI STEM event that our branch created which is in the STEM UK resources I actually have an open uh, offer to schools uh, to, to to deliver it and literally I got a, um, a request uh, this afternoon for um, a talk a talk so I see Sarah's eyes lit up there uh, it's 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 to um, A level students who are doing very well with their maths, physics, chemistry, computer science. Um, they 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 want to, up up in Rochdale. They've actually asked for um, a, a talk on quality. I don't think we can do our flying aeroplanes to task to that lot because um, they're uh, A level age. But um, uh, yes, it was just everybody trying to get quality um the quality profession into into the spotlight as something that um to be honest with you anybody can take up because it's all transferable skills um that you get problem solving people management um all of those types of things that um are 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 used within the quality um profession uh, they don't have to come from necessarily engineering or um, where the traditional route in is from so interesting Jonathan um, has put in a uh, an example um, of, a, of, of a mistake so Jonathan I don't know whether you want to actually open up your mic and, and, and talk about it it seems quite a uh, an interesting uh, example. Uh, uh, am I on? Yes. Yes, good. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Um, I think one of the problems of being in QA, quality control, quality assurance, is I've come away from days at the factory wondering if we can make anything right at all. And yeah, we just seem to be incapable of doing anything. But actually, our failure rate is, um, maybe I ought not to say, but it's actually pretty low. Um, and I'm always faced with the ones that have gone wrong. Um, most of the things we produce are right. The vast majority of what we produce is right. But you have to laugh at some of the mistakes we've made over the years. And the, the inside out ones are really funny. I mean, <clears throat> jolly annoying and expensive and all the rest of it. But we're forming materials. And the guys on the presses sometimes just get it backwards in their heads. Um, so <laughs> it sort of mm. works. And... Um, it works as well, you know, you've got a perfectly good product, but it's it's like it's something like it's out of the TARDIS. It's, it has, it's inside out. How did you make it? Yes. <laughs> so if, if you 3D print something, it can go down the production line, particularly the beginning of the forming process. So they get it the right way out to begin with. Mm. Um, and also now it's become much easier to have 3D CAD models on, on the shop floor and have them rolling around on the screen. You know, that... We're, we're putting more and more and more computers, um, iPad type things on every machine. Um, so this is, is really quite a new idea for us because uh, having people with access to the computer systems isn't what they're used to. And you have to work with the people. We, everybody's different, everybody's unique and you really have to work with them. We have some people who like to arrive at so sort of seven o'clock in the morning and they put on their gear and they really don't talk to anybody at all. They just muckle down and just do whatever it is they do and then have a couple of breaks and a lunch break. And then at uh, four o'clock or whatever, they go home. And um, that's what they like. And sort of don't, don't interfere with what I'm doing. And you have to sort of work on when you're auditing somebody like that, how do you approach them? And you try to introduce humor into things. And Inside Out is one of the examples of humor that we use. Mm. So, you know, things do go wrong. Excellent. Um, we try to teach people not to cover up mistakes. Um, and people don't yeah. like to admit to mistakes. And so actually, because we're, we're, I don't know how many of us are aerospace or healthcare or what have you, but quite a few of us are. Um, you know, that's how aircraft fall out of the sky. And you just can't have it. So people have to, we have to create a culture in which people can make mistakes and own up to them. Yes, yeah, so I've cover actually, them up. 
Excellent. Yes, I've actually been um, teaching human factors um, throughout today, all day on Zoom and um, talking about a just culture uh, to be able to, um, without fear of any retribution, mm -hmm. um, owning up, up to issues. But it's not necessarily a no blame culture, uh, because if somebody deliberately does something wrong, then uh, yes, they, they, they need to be taken to task. But a just culture is uh, is the one that we're targeting and talking Absolutely. about talking about your inside out thing um i remember once when i was um wallpapering my mother-in-law's kitchen and um, when i eventually offered up this piece of this piece of paper i thought oops it works that way round <laughs> but it doesn't work that way round so there you go <laughs> yes i think we've all come close to that one or we've done that and we're sort of trying yeah. to do it again so I'm sort of trying to think of other mistakes that we make. Um, um, fun, funny ones are an ability to count, um, where we've had about 35 components. They sit in your hand, each one, just a stack of them. And we've had three external auditors, two senior managers and the operative. And none of us can agree how many are actually in that pile. And <laughs> you end up holding them up in route one to you like a cat bank teller um, because they're springy you can't measure the height of them and things like that so there's funny things that go wrong mm. um, trying to work out just exactly how many of these are there um, yeah interesting I, 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 think, it... I think you just have to keep a sort of sense of proportion at, at all times and know that people are doing their best and just strange things will happen mm. Excellent. Okay. And can we just move over to you because you've just put something interesting into the chat. That would be great. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, I have experienced in the 90s what shifts in culture and leadership can do to the team. So when I started my, I was very lucky, my first management role, my my boss was one of life's last gentlemen, I think. He just said, look, Ange, whatever decision you make, even if you get it wrong and I don't agree with you, I will always back you because I'll believe mm. that you made the best decision that you could at the time. So that's how I started my first role. Unfortunately, when he moved on and his son took over, it was a very different uh, culture. If people were talking or socialising, uh, it was better be about work. Otherwise, you just crack on. Um, and I watched the the workforce completely change and they were so afraid. You know, we were, I, I mean, obviously I was in metal pressing and if you put a component into the jig wrong uh, and brought it over, then the jig needed checking. But they were so afraid they would take it home in their handbag. And then obviously the jig stayed in that condition, didn't get re reserviced and we'd get a lot more and have to find them. But it, they were they were petrified literally mm -hmm. and that was the change in the in the culture and the leadership and what it did so we had far more problems because of the blame culture yeah wow it, that's quite a shift yeah that's not good is it and adrian saying um in his early years he made a point of learning from the trades yes because we've been mm -hmm. talking about that and the best learning they taught me was shortcuts to get past specs and and doing things and doing things right yeah Good. So thank you very much, everybody. And I want to pass on a, an extra special thank you to Victoria Tate, who has been our host for this evening. So thank you very much, Victoria. I'm just going to share my screen again. And I just want to mention that um, our, our title has been um, inspired by a, a book that um, some of us have and some of us are starting to read, um, Guts and Grace, um, A Woman's Guide to a full, to Full-Bodied Leadership. And uh, I think maybe if we, once, once we've all read it, we can, we can almost have a book club to, um, uh, to learn from it. So yes, thank you very much to all of our panelists, especially to Victoria. And I'd just like to um, thank everybody to, to be here as well, who's, who's been here to, to support us. And um, please join us for our next Derby and Nottingham event, which is actually a face-to-face -face event. Um, we are going to the Amazon um, Logistics Facility 
at East Midlands Airport on the 22nd of October. We are on a wait list at the moment, but I am trying to um, get some more places. So I believe I will be able to. So if you put your name down on the waiting list, um, I am going to be uh, doing my best to extend the 20 slots that we've got. We might be able to double it to 40 to get two tours um, going round. So if you are at all interested in that, please do go on to the CQI's events um, area and uh, book yourself onto that event, which starts at 6.30 on, in the evening on the 22nd of October. So, as I say, thank you very much. Um, we welcome for you to stay to have a chat and do some networking. Otherwise, uh, thank you for attending um, on behalf of myself and all of the panellists. And we look forward to seeing you next time we hold an event. Thank you very much. <laughs>